Welcome to another low angle video. Why are we here? <laughs> We're here because this, you remember this? You should, it's a character on this channel practically. This over here is, did we give this a name? I think we gave this a name. Anyway, this is the Studio Trainer QA PC, which I've powered on probably about half a dozen times in my life, but st I still care for her. And the reason why she is significant is because today we are going to be testing Hazel. So this is a bit of a series of videos that if you missed the last one, you might not know what I'm talking about. Last one will be linked up there, here. I never get the corner right. Uh, my name is Cherno, by the way, and I'm making a game engine. Boom. Right, so I'm also using a different lens today. So check this out. Do you guys like this wide view? 16 mil, baby. And the reason why, by the way, is because I used to use this guy. This is a, I really like this lens. Like this is my favorite lens. It's like a Sony G Master, really like great lens. But then just one day just stopped working. Like this is what I filmed or used to film up until about two months ago, the majority of my videos on. But then like it stopped working, like electronically stopped working, meaning like no autofocus, no like aperture that I can adjust, just like doesn't even recognize this lens. And I tried it on multiple camera bodies, no. Nah. So I gotta like, I don't know, go through warranty or something probably. It's about, it's probably about two years old. And then so I've been shooting most of my videos on this lens, which is a Sigma 35mm 1.4. But then I kind of just wanted to be able to pull it out, you know, for this video. So now I can go between 35mm and 16 mil. I apologize if none of you cared, but I just wanted to share that with you. I also think that this new focal length is gonna like reveal parts of the studio that no one has ever seen before. So hopefully that won't be a bad thing. Um, so let's talk about this computer a little bit. I think there was like a, I made a video about Hazel QA. Um, I don't remember exactly when that was, but it's kind of interesting because now we actually get to kind of put all of this to the test because I didn't, I didn't kind of use this as much for the previous release. And primarily the reason for that was because we had Tim. Now I know a lot of you asked what on earth happened to Tim. Tim used to be a member of Studio Cherno. He used to work. He actually used to like sit and work right here. Now a printer is there. So what happened to Tim? Well, he quit. He decided that working on Hazel was such an experience that he just quit this entire industry and now he works in sales. So yeah, that's, um, I'm gonna try and avoid doing that in the future to future employees, and I'm sorry, but that that is what happened. Like, I'm not making this up. So yeah, Tim is gone. We're definitely gonna miss him. Uh, I did not fire him, he resigned, so I just wanna get that cleared. But that what, what that means is that now I can't be like, hey Tim, um, you know, just test all of Hazel. In retrospect, that may have been one of the, the things that pushed him towards quitting, but nevertheless, I kind of need to have a little bit more of like a QA strategy for Hazel. I mean, either way, it would have been heading towards this direction, but I need to have a little bit more of a solid QA strategy for Hazel that doesn't involve telling one person to just go through and test the entire engine. And so that is why we're gonna have this computer which is gonna kind of go through everything and it's gonna do some automated tests. It's gonna just like build commits of the code, make sure everything's compiling. One of the things Tim was working on before he left was actually an automated kind of Hazel scene runner because I saw this coming, not Tim leaving, but because I knew that in the future, we're obviously going to want to not get Tim to just spend all his time testing everything, but we need an automated way. So I got Tim working on that. And what he built was some kind of like C sharp application, I believe that will kind of launch the Hazel runtime. That runtime would then effectively run the Hazel QA project, which is a collection of scenes that are designed for testing different systems of the engine. It would actually look into the asset pack of that project to see all the scenes that were available, and then it would just basically just go through all the scenes, run them for a configurable amount of time, such as 60 seconds, then move on to the next scene inside that asset pack. So it's just a really simple way of us basically just building like, I don't know, as many scenes as we want, like say 50 scenes, and then having like an application that just runs each of those scenes for 50 seconds, and then reports like, you know, stuff like frame rates and other metrics, as well as like, did we crash or not, which is kind of a preliminary test. I would also like it to, you know, take screenshots and maybe publish them somewhere so that someone like a human could just kind of look at this and be like, all right, 
animation scene. Like, does that look right? And then at a minimum, you know, if we kind of get that process happening for every single commit that goes into like the development branch, which is the kind of branch that everyone's features go into. And then obviously like the staging branch, which is the one that we're kind of preparing for release, then that's going to be great. And that's going to mean that at a minimum, you know, we're not going to accidentally just crash all the time. As long as those test scenes are designed in a good way that actually does test the majority of the different, you know, properties and systems Hazel might have, then it really should be just as simple as kind of comparing expected results versus what we actually got like now when we ran the test. Now, if you're just getting started with computer science and programming and you're finding it a little bit difficult, you need some help, then boy, do I have an excellent free suggestion for you. And that is the sponsor of this video, Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is an amazing website filled with lots and lots of really high quality courses on various STEM topics. Now they have some excellent computer science courses. And the thing with Brilliant is that their teaching style is extremely clear, concise, visual and engaging. It can be hard to learn some of these topics. So why not make it easier for yourselves by picking a learning style that suits you? And in my opinion, that learning style is just what Brilliant does. Because having these widgets that you can play with, getting constantly quizzed so that the information that you're just learning now gets properly processed and you remember it. That can be a really effective way to learn. And as you're seeing, it extends into like all of these advanced math topics, which I personally think greatly benefit from this approach to learning. And here's the thing, you can get started for free. They have a 30 day free trial, which you can use to check out all of the courses they have. Just go to brilliant.org slash the channel, link will be in the description below. And if you do go on to like it, Brilliant have been nice enough to offer the first 200 of you 20% off an annual membership. Huge thank you as always to brilliant.org for sponsoring this video. Now, the thing is, this thing that Tim made, uh, I actually, I don't have it. It's actually on Tim's computer. Well, it's on the, it's on Studio Cherno's computer technically, but it's the one that Tim used to use at his desk, which I just showed. So we're going to have to just jump on that computer and I'm going to have to like recover it because I don't know where it is. It should be somewhere on the hard drive. So we're just going to kind of explore it and see where Tim left off. And, um, yeah, that's kind of the, that's what we're doing today. We're, <laughs> we're going to see how far Tim got with his little test runner and whether or not we can just take it, plop it onto this, maybe adapt it with the newest version of Hazel and get some tests running. And I expect that obviously we're gonna to have to extend it a bit. From memory, because last time we spoke about this was probably three months ago, from memory, I believe Tim had it running and iterating through all the scenes for like 60 seconds. I don't know if things like frame rates were reported or where they were reported to, but at the minimum, I believe it should run. And in fact, while we're at it, we need to look at the, this, ha this Hazel QA project because I haven't actually had much of a look into that. I know Peter has, I know Peter's made some kind of physics test scenes and maybe even some scripting test scenes for that Hazel QA project. And this Hazel QA project is essentially like a game we've built with a collection of scenes which is designed to test, you know, everything <laughs> that Hazel has to offer, every single feature. So we might have like a physics test scene, which is just like a bunch of different rigid bodies with different properties. There might be like some kind of graphics test scene that just like manipulates graphics settings. There'll be like an animation test scene that sets up like a skeletal animation with whatever other animation features we might have and tries to play those animations. So the idea is we can just like look at these and see if the engine is working as required. Now, a big downside with this system is obviously this is just designed to test Hazel's kind of runtime. So like you've made a scene in Hazel, let's hit play, let's see what happens, right? This does not test the editor itself. And we don't really have a solution for that at the moment. Like how do we know if we try and add a component to something, is the engine gonna crash? At the moment, that's like human testing and that obviously is not good. So we need to kind of come up with a way to, I guess, automate editor actions and run through that. But I have plans for that because, well, we'll talk about that in another video. Uh... So this is, I guess this is gonna be like a typical, actually like, like real devlog because I've just spent like the last few hours doing something that I now realize was a, a huge mistake. I don't even know why I decided to go down this rabbit hole. And so I guess I'll talk about it. I'll talk about what I've been doing on this QA PC here. <sighs> so, I mean, we've been talking about automation, right? We've been talking about how we can get this stuff tested automatically because I can't sit here. I mean, no one on the team can really sit here just testing this stuff over and over again. And some of the tests are so kind of black and white. Like for example, does this compile? Like we don't need a human testing that. That's very like yes or no. Of course, if you're dealing with like some more advanced things, like oh, does the physics feel right? Does the graphics like look correct? Like that can be a little bit harder to automate, but some of these things like 
really should just be done automatically. And so I'm sitting here kind of thinking about how this is going to work. And, you know, we have a development branch that contains all of the commits kind of from the team that come together, you know, into this dev branch. I think I should probably take the time at some point to formally explain uh, and maybe even have a diagram, you know, on, on the website or something, just, you know, all these kind of branch structures and how they work, because I, I feel like I always keep repeating myself. But anyway, the idea is every time someone does commit into this dev branch, I kind of want to run my automated tests on there. And like step one is just really just making sure it, it compiles in all the configurations and reporting any build errors. Like that, that's step one. So then how do I do that? Because I need to know, obviously, when we have new commits coming in to the repository, whenever someone pushes to our Git repository on GitHub, like I need to, you know, download that commit, basically pull that commit and then build the code and eventually run tests on it. So there are a few different ways that I can do that. The first thing that came to mind was just having some kind of CI, which stands for continuous integration, running on the actual GitHub like repository, because there's this thing called GitHub Actions that lets you kind of set up things to happen when there are certain events in the repository. But the reason why I don't think that's a good fit is because I need to run this stuff on this computer. It, this isn't like a web app or some kind of like, you know, a simple case of just like building and that's it and making sure this compiles. Like, no, I need to run tests on this. I need to report things like performance and frame rate and memory usage. Like this has to be a real kind of computer running this and not just a real computer running this, but also a computer whose hardware I can control. Because at the moment we have an RTX 3060 in here, but like there's a GTX 1650 lying around in the office. We have some AMD cards as well. Like we need to actually make sure that Hazel is getting tested properly on all of these different cards because most of the development team is obviously running much higher powered cards. Like I have a 3080, Peter has a 3070. The majority of, you know, actual real world people who play games, at least according to the Steam hardware survey, seem to have either a 3060 or a 1650. So we clearly need to make sure that we're accurately kind of testing Hazel's performance on those cards and then reporting this stuff so that we we know, you know, over time, is this engine getting faster? Is it getting slower? Across like the huge number of tests that we have to run. So my point is this isn't something that a server can execute. This is something that needs to happen on a real computer with a real graphics card in a fully kind of controllable way. And so that's why this QA kind of, I guess it's also like a CI machine now, but like this this computer, that's what it's for. So then I'm like, okay, well, you know, if this, if this is the computer that needs to run that stuff, then uh, I guess GitHub Actions goes out the window, at least as far as I'm aware. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm missing something. That's always possible. You guys can always let me know in the comments below. And also like, I, I don't wanna go too in depth into the, the solution here as well, which is why, like I'm not showing you my screen at the moment because I don't know, I, like I never know how to make these videos. Like it seems to me like it would be better for me to kind of show this when it's actually working in full because I imagine that like it's gonna change a bit, you know, as I go through this. And I don't know if you wanna like hear me talking about all these things that I might do and you know, all of this discussion versus actually just showing you, hey guys, I did this thing. I, like, I don't know how to make these devlogs, honestly. I keep saying that, but I just have no idea what I'm doing. Please let me know if you're enjoying this kind of, well, this video, I guess, which is mostly me just talking about what's going on. So back to what is going on then. This computer has to be made aware every time there is a new commit going into that GitHub repository. So my next kind of thought was, well, I can just use a webhook maybe. Now a webhook just allows you to put in a URL into GitHub, into your repository settings. And then when like a subset of events occur on that repository, GitHub will simply, you know, call that URL with some payload. We talked about this in the uh, documentation website video, which I'll have linked up there. We used a webhook. In fact, we still use a webhook on docs.hazelengine.com so that every time there is an update to that repository containing documentation, it will rebuild the kind of static website. Uh, the thing is though, that website, obviously, that documentation website, that's hosted on like a, a Linux server. Like that is, is, that's not like a computer in the office. That's an actual VPN. Yes. So I was like, well, um, uh, I don't know, like, what should I do? Should I maybe set this up to be a web server? And so I ended up installing Nginx on Windows, which, uh, I don't know, it just feels wrong. 
<laughs> honestly. <laughs> I ended up like forwarding my ports. Uh, I ended up discovering that apparently Nginx can't run in like just HTTP. Like it has to have an SSL certificate to be used externally. So not just local host. And then I was kind of going through like certbot and trying to set that up like I would for a server. And then I was like, man, what am I doing? Like this is like, this is hugely annoying. Like for so many reasons, like, I mean, first of all, I don't even have a static IP address for this office. Like it's just a dynamic IP. So I'm gonna have to update it every now and then. I don't even know how often that kind of external IP address is gonna change. But also it's extremely annoying to, to deploy this because this is something that has to run well, hope, I, I like I'd want this automation basically to run on more than just this computer. Why? Because as I mean, this is just one computer. What if I wanted to run on the AMD computer? Or what if I wanted to run on that 1650 computer? Because this is this is the RTX 3060. I mean that like the 1650 doesn't even have a computer, it's just lying lying down there. And I suppose I could install multiple graphics cards in one computer just to not have to build so many computers and just have it kind of select which device to use. But either way, it would obviously be be nice to just have an out of the box solution that doesn't require you to set up a web server and forward ports and do whatever on earth else to just simply run this. So I was like, well, why don't, why don't I just, you know, do this the simple way and just poll GitHub to be like, hey man, do you have a new commit on this branch? Like, yes, I guess that's not as cool as a little push event that's just like, hey man, you, you got a new commit, but this is just so much, easier and it means that really all it is is a self-contained kind of script that just runs like on any computer you want it can just be in the hazel repository you just clone hazel and you can be like this computer is now a ci machine like this computer is now capable of running automated tests and retrieving new commits by itself like that is just so much easier so much more portable like why on earth would i set up a web server so that was my day um, that was, yeah. So what I've done at the moment is like, I'm using, again, I'll probably show this like when it's done, but I'm using something called Git Python, which is like a Git package for Python, which just gives you like a nice API that you can use to run Git commands. And I've just got it like looking at the, the local repository here, connecting to like the remote, seeing what the latest kind of, you know, commit hash is on that remote and just comparing it to like what the current head is, you know, on the local, repository. And then if they're different, well, I'm going to run my little build script, which I have here, which is just simply going to, you know, call setup, which initializes all the sub modules and does some other stuff to generate the actual project files for Hazel using premake. And then it's going to just call MS build to actually build like the Hazel solution in debug release and dist configurations. So I've got that basically working. Uh, I'd like to kind of clean it up and there's a lot of kind of, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? The Git Python, um, package, uh, the documentation is atrocious. I don't know, maybe I'm the problem, but like I have had to guess certain things because I've searched for them and they're actively not there. It's like, it, they'll tell you like what functions or like variables are available on a certain object and then half of them just aren't there. The API reference is like seemingly half complete unless I'm just an idiot and I'm not reading it properly somehow. <sighs> but anyway, that's um that's where I'm at right now. I'm gonna end this video here. There'll probably be another video next week. I'm trying to just kind of make, I guess, more frequent videos just cause I always feel like there's a lot to talk about and I hope that this is interesting to some of you. I feel like this, and this is gonna get real meta now, but I feel like there's this kind of pressure sometimes on YouTube to try and show exciting stuff. And like, I Again, I could wait like a month or whatever while I set this up behind the scenes and then be like, here's a video of how I did this from start to finish. But the thing is, I don't know, I just feel like, you know, life is about the journey and these videos are the journey. As of right now, this, this, this is not done. So being able to discuss it without actually knowing the correct you know, solution is kind of cool. And my hope is that you guys kind of feel a little bit more involved with the project. You get more frequent updates as to like what's going on with Hazel and the team. I really wanted to show you in this video, the actual Hazel QA project, which I ended up getting off of Tim's computer. Well, actually it wasn't even like j just on Tim's computer. He actually pushed it like into our kind of studio channel GitHub. But yeah, that project is huge and covers so many different systems and little kind of parameters that Hazel has. So maybe next video I will show 
show you guys the kind of Hazel QA project that we're gonna end up hooking up into this automation test. And then I still have to write that kind of test runner application, the thing that will actually automatically load up that Hazel QA project, play it in the runtime and kind of iterate through all the scenes to test everything and report the metrics. So we haven't even begun digging into this. If I might say one more thing before I end this video that probably should have ended a while ago, it's gonna be that making these videos it's kind of showing almost to me just how complicated some of this stuff is. Because sometimes like to me, it's almost like, oh yeah, just get like, you know, some automated testing going. That'll be a piece of cake, one video done. But now that I'm actually kind of going into this in detail and like vlogging about it as I go through the process, it's like it's showing me that actually like if I was to explain every step here, like it's really not that simple. So yeah, welcome to the real world. I'm being real now.